Welcome everyone to the Lean Startup Company webcast series. I'm Heather McGough, co-founder of Lean Startup Company. We support entrepreneurs and corporate innovators across industries and around the world through our education program, our media, and events. Today's guest is Mozilla CFO Jim Cook, who was instrumental in running many of the early Netflix experiments. He'll be interviewed by our own Lean Startup Company senior faculty member, Hugh Malozzi. They'll be discussing how Netflix ran hundreds of experiments during its early years as a startup. With that, I'll hand it over to you, Hugh. Thank you, Heather. Uh, so it's a great pleasure to be here with Jim Cook. Uh, Jim and I go way back. Uh, we both, uh, many lifetimes ago, worked at Intuit. Um, and uh, I'm actually here at Mozilla, where uh, Jim uh, has uh, his current gig, which uh, I'm hoping he'll tell us a little bit about. Uh, but today, um, we're going to talk to Jim about uh, his experience uh, at Netflix, where uh, he was uh, instrumental in running a lot of the key experiments that helped uh, Netflix become very popular. So, Jim, thanks for agreeing to be part of the webcast today and for sharing your experiences from when you worked at Netflix. Before we start, uh, please share a little bit about your background. And, of course, uh, you know, you can t talk about uh, Intuit and uh, tell us what you've been doing since then. Yeah, happy to. Thanks, you, And thanks, um, Lean Startup. This is great. Um, I love telling the story, and I love sharing with other entrepreneurs, so um, I'm excited to do this. Um, yeah, so as you said, you and I worked way back in the Intuit days. Uh, I started Intuit in 1991. Um, I was there for about five years. At the time, we were about a 100-person company, startup for sure, one product startup. Um, and no one had really ever heard of Intuit yet. Uh, we had one product, Quicken for Mac, and Quicken for DOS, and Quicken for Windows. Um, hadn't been quite released yet. Uh, so that's kind of the background of Intuit. Intuit eventually grew up into a um, what it is today. You know, they're the makers of TurboTax, as many of you probably know, uh, as well as Quicken and QuickBooks and many other products. Um, and they're a multi-billion dollar company, but you know we from my tenure there in a period of short five years, we went from 100 employees um, to over 3,000 employees. We went from a one-product company to a multi-product, multi-division company, international company. So saw a lot in those five years, um, worked with a lot of great people, you and, and many of the others, um, and learned a lot. Um, jumped into one of the first e-commerce companies in 1996 when the Internet was taking off. Uh, it was called the Internet Shopping Network, for any of you who may remember it. Um, we were one of the first three e-commerce companies. Uh, the other two were Amazon and CDNow. Um, Amazon did books only at the time. CDNow was another e-commerce startup doing only music, uh, CDs, as its name implied. And Internet Shopping Network did everything computer-related, all computers, peripherals. Um, so that's how e-commerce day started in 1996. Uh, that was that company was eventually sold a year and a half later, um, and uh, one of the first calls I got after that experience was a small little six-person startup, which I'm here talking about today, called Netflix. So that was 1997, um, and I say that with a little bit of a pause because I realized that was um, 17 years ago, maybe actually 18. Sorry, let's keep going. 20 years ago. I keep trying to age myself. I don't like to do it. Uh, 20 years ago. Wow. Uh, but Netflix was started 20 years ago, and very much like CD Now and Amazon and ISN, we started with just seeing if we could mail discs uh, you know, DVDs to the mail. DVDs had just been launched in March of 1997, uh, and we decided to see if we can disrupt and be the biggest blockbuster on the planet. Um, from there, I, um, I left Netflix in 1999 um, through some um, changes, management changes, and other opportunities. I joined uh, another e-commerce startup calling, called Wine Shopper. Um, it was the largest Series A run by Kleiner Perkins and Amazon in 1999. And um, that, I'll get into that maybe later, but that, um, we eventually, that eventually closed down in the dot-com burst. Uh, we went through the bubble and the uh, burst. Um, did some interim CFO consulting for uh, several years, and I landed at Mozilla in 2005. So I've been here ever since. Um, again, we've grown Mozilla from 18 employees to over 1,000 employees now, from $0 to um, over 
four hundred million in revenue and four hundred million in cash, and it's a great another great startup story. So I've been blessed to have been involved at the at the very beginnings of several startups um, that are now worth um, you know ten or eleven digits, tens of billions, um, and one in particular, the wine shopper that actually is worth less than zero um, as it went chapter seven. So a lot of successes, a lot of failures. I think you learn from both, and that's my background. Yeah, you probably learn more from the... the yeah, we could write a whole book about wine shopper, <laughs> believe me. Yeah. Okay, that's great, yeah. And um, hope you'll have the time to talk about uh, uh, some of your other experiences, uh, like uh, Mozilla, I think. But sure. today, obviously, we're interested in Netflix. So the, in the book Netflixed uh, by Gina Keating, she describes how before you joined uh, Netflix, you, you, re you reviewed their business plan as a favor. And you saw lots of problems and had serious doubts about its viability. So how the heck were they able to convince you to join them? Um, so, you know, I, I think I, I listed 35 different reasons why this company wasn't going to succeed. Um, we were told, that even after, you know, two years of raising money, that, we, that many VCs thought this was the craziest idea. Um, but, you know, I, I give credit to the, 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 uh, my other co-founders. Um, Mark Randolph was the uh, CEO. Christina Kish, Hugh and Hugh, you and I have worked with Christina at Intuit. Um, Christina called me up and said, "We need some help. You're the e-commerce expert that we know, and, and you know finance, new operations. Come and give us a hand on exploring this business." Um, so, to their credit, um, I kept listing all the reasons why this wouldn't work in classic finance and operational um, ways, you know, like a, like a CFO might. And to their credit, they were steadfast entrepreneurs that kept saying, well, what if we did this and what if we did that? Um, and so we were going through whiteboard exercises for three or four weeks um, until I realized just how passionate a team this was, how aligned I was with the way they thought about starting a business. And I think it's a good story for entrepreneurs to um, to stick with it and to, and to get over those hurdles and to see if you can be aligned with a team and uh, your, your eventual co-founders. And if you are, then jump straight in. You don't have to have all the answers, just the, just the hard ones. Uh -huh. um, and see and you see your way through, because there are many more hard answers, questions and answers after that. So, yeah, I felt like I was really aligned with the co-founders. And these, uh, you know, what if we did X or Y to your 35 concerns, were these convincing to you, or was it just... Oh, yeah, yeah. No, I mean, sure, they were very convincing, and they're like, that's, that's interesting. Um, I mean, remember, we were talking about shipping um, shipping discs through the mail, right? At the time, we've come to learn, we've we, we, we come to be accustomed to that for people that were old customers of Netflix envelopes. But in the early days, this was considered crazy, absolutely crazy. Right. In the e-commerce days, those early e-commerce days, if you had more than 2% returns on your product, you had a chance of being out of business rather shortly. We're talking about a product that required 100% returns and was using the U.S. Post Office as their shipper. Hmm. Lots of issues there. Yeah. Right? Um, and actually, it might be good for maybe even some of our younger viewers who only know of Netflix in its current incarnation. Right about, uh, you know, what that Netflix uh, yeah, founding story was. For the first 10 years of Netflix, 1997 to 2007, uh, I think I have my dates right. I'm pretty sure streaming didn't come into being until 2008. Um, we were a 100% disc shipping company, a disc, a CD, a DVD, which was in the same platform as a CD, just with more gigabytes on it. Um, a DVD could hold 4.7 gigabytes, and it could fit one movie. And so it, this was the transition from... VHS tapes, VCR tapes, to DVDs, and we were the DVD rental business. And we were, you know, set up to make it faster and easier and more convenient than your local Hollywood video or, or Blockbuster store. Um, and we were in the new format that had a higher resolution and the picture looked a lot better, and it was a brand new industry. So we were shipping discs in the mail for 10 years. And that's how Netflix got started, and that's how it got its, its critical mass so that it could then jump into what you see today which is streaming, but you're right. A lot of people don't even remember the red envelope of the disc, so that's how old it is. That's great. So um, what were your initial responsibilities, and how did you get involved in running experiments? Sure. So um, initial responsibilities was, was if it belonged in finance or belonged in operations, um, those were my original responsibilities. Um, Mark was the CEO, and Christina was uh, marketing, uh -huh. And we had a couple other engineers, and there was another um, critical person called T. Smith, 
her name was T. Smith. Uh, she was also in, in marketing and communications uh, and PR. And, um, and so if it, if it touched finance and operations, I set it up. I set up the first accounting systems, the first warehouse, uh, inventory, uh, anything with ordering the product, inventorying the product, shipping the product. I have my fingerprints all over it. And, um, you know, what, what, what experiences did you draw upon to, to be able to handle a job like this? Well, it's interesting. So like any startup, um, you, you lean back on, of course, your year and a half. I had a year and a half of e-commerce experience, so I knew a little bit more about how e-commerce worked um, back then. But really, you rely on your experiences that we learned it into it back in, in the early days, um, which really was like your true North Star and your true guidepost is the customer. Like, what does the customer want? How can you make this faster and easier and more convenient? Um, and so we were, we were on a new journey of trying to make DVD rental more faster, easier, more convenient. And everything we did from the packaging on down was around that. You know, we, and we were making up stuff as we went along, which is fine. As long as it was faster and easier and more convenient for the customer, we could make it up all we wanted, and we did. So that was our, that was our guidepost for sure. Yeah, one of the amazing things about the, the Netflix story, I mean, this was happening approximately around the time when WebVan was happening. And if you, if you, yep. know, if you know about the WebVan... WebVan a couple years later, but yes, you're right. If nice you know the WebVan story, sure. you know, they, they kind of took a very opposite approach, which was, hey, you know, they're going to build, you know, this very large, sophisticated operation with a huge amount of investment. Uh, and not they didn't actually do much in, by way of experimentation. But, you know, obviously experimentation was very key to your approach and I think key to the success. So how did you know that that was going to be the thing to do? Oh, well, when you experiment, you don't know it's, it's going to be the <laughs> thing to do. So we took the scientific method to the extreme. So my other co-founders just love, you know, testing and measuring and, and redoing. So we just assumed that anything we did was um, we needed to continuously improve it. And that's the whole thing about experimenting. So you're right, WebVan was about getting big fast, buying not the top, you know, the Fortune 500, not partnering with the Fortune 500 companies or the Fortune 50 companies, but WebVan and others in this get big fast e-commerce heady days of bubble were, were um, investing in Fortune 5 companies to do all of their warehousing and things. Um, but in the early days of software and, and internet shopping network and Netflix, it was all about, we had to do this on a shoestring budget. We started Netflix on $2 million. Oh. You know, Scott Cook put his last $100,000 of his um, home equity loan into, into Intuit before it almost failed. So this was in our DNA. Um, and so we just ran a bunch of different experiences, exper experiments, mostly from the envelope, but uh -huh. also from marketing. You know, we were the first company to put um, a coupon in the box. So... When I say the box, we're like, well, where are our customers? Where are they going to get exposed to this new industry called DVDs? And there were only three manufacturers of hardware DVD players at the time, Sony, Panasonic, and Toshiba. And the brilliant, you might by brilliant, you know, uh, founding team members like Mark and Christina said, we're going to get a coupon in every one of those boxes. So when they open that box up for Christmas, the very thing, first thing they see is a Netflix coupon for 10 free rentals. That was a gigantic experiment, but it worked. And, the, you know, the first one was, I think, white, and then the next ones were purple. Some of them were then red. How do we make sure they look at our coupon, uh, not other people's coupons? Because it was probably a stack of coupons. Yeah, how do we make that coupon stand up? Yeah. Exactly. Ten free rentals. Do we like, highlight that and decrease our name? What we wanted was people to use it, so that, that's an experiment. Wow. Um, designing the envelope was an experiment. Right? How, is it, how do we design an envelope so that this doesn't get broken? I mean, several. You know, we started with three discs in one envelope for cost savings for two reasons. One, we knew people usually watch more than one movie at a time. Yeah. Two, we couldn't get the discs there as fast as we eventually did. We eventually were able to ship discs in 24 hours door to door from wherever a customer ordered it. In the early days, it took four or five days. This was a big problem. So if it's going to take four to five days, we'll put three discs in an envelope, and they'll be able to watch those three and then order the next three and return the next three. And subscriptions weren't even a thing yet, right? This was a one order, one return, next order kind of business when we first started. Um, 
we started paying really close attention to the customers, started experimenting with subscriptions in 1999. Um, finding out that people really wanted to, uh, really, you know, not finding out, but, but reminding ourselves and talking to a lot of customers. We talked to all the customers, many of them. And we found out that they knew what they wanted to watch days and weeks in advance. Well, if our customers knew what they wanted to watch next, why wait for them to tell us? Yeah. Just create the very first subscription queue, which we did. We were the very first company to say, we know, like, why don't you tell us what you want to order next, and then we'll order inventory to match that. It's brilliant, right? right? Yeah, that's great. Nowadays, it's kind of, oh, yeah, of course, that makes sense, <laughs> right? But back then, it was a brand new idea. Yeah, so. that's fantastic. And, you know, I want to get into some of the experiment stories because I think that's where a lot of our viewers will get a ton of value. Sure. Because I think today a lot of people, you know, unlike back in the in, in the 90s, I think today a lot of people agree that experimentation is the right approach for startups and even for small teams and large companies. But people still struggle with running experiments. And I think one of the things in, in reading the book and hearing some of your stories, it's very impressive how well uh, you ran these experiments. Now, you know, today we have books like Eric Ries has uh, his book, The Lean Startup, which gives entrepreneurs lots of material, lots of examples uh, to use. Um, you know, how did how did you know how to run an experiment, and what was your guide? So, to be honest, we didn't. We were not exper experimental experts by any means. By any means, we we were just we were trying to figure out what was going to work, and if it wasn't going to work for the customer or for the business, we killed it fast. So it was really out of it wasn't out of like being great experimenters. Uh -huh. It was really all in service to, did it work for the customer, did it, did it not? Is it scalable, is it not? And if we couldn't pass those two litmus tests, then we tried something else. So I, you know, I think in hindsight, oh yeah, we ran a lot of great experiments and it was really cool, but that's not really how we thought about it. We thought about it in service of the customer and in service of the business. And killing a lot of things in between. And out of necessity, we only had $2 million. Um, how, how did you know whether it worked for the customer or not? Oh, we talked to the customer. You know, so we'd get an e we had emails back in 1997, so we had emails. Um, we would actually call our customers to talk to them. They would call us up. Anytime that we, we had a customer service support line, like we would take the time to find out what the problem is, what's working, what's not, and we would pattern match. Um, so, for example, you want you wanted an example. Um, the envelope is the most obvious example. The envelope at first was not red. In fact, it was white. Um, and it was white for a reason. We didn't want these things being stolen. So everything we did had a reason behind it. Uh -huh. We wanted it to be a plain brown, brown, you know, vanilla package that that people wouldn't know there was a disc inside there. Very valuable disc to steal. Um, so we made them white and or brown on purpose um, to make them look like any other envelope. Um, today they're red for a different purpose because the USP or not today. Well, even today. Um, but about four or five years in, we realized that we can employ the U.S. Postal Service's help. Um, and we, re we went to the U.S. Postal Service. I spent three months personally in there. Um, and we found out that, you know, they offered a service in which they could help sort the mail on the line coming down, and they would just look for the red envelopes and pull them out. We had to make them distinctive, right? And then we can process them differently. So um, more stories of envelopes. Like when I spent the first three. So hold on, you're saying it was red for just for better, easier processing. And it's better for a marketing and branding for sure, um, but it was also easier for processing at the postal facilities, right. at the gold mail facilities. You could just see it coming off this huge, these huge volumes of mail. And what people don't know about the post office, many people don't know, it's um, there's a what's called a um, a GMF, a global mail facility, and. Uh, these are hubs, right? These the, the, the post office uh, sets up their operations in kind of a hub and spoke model, very classic operational logistical model. Um, and their central GMFs that are all like San Jose's one, San Francisco's one. Every major metropolitan city has one. All the mail from all the cities, all the planes come into these general mail facilities, and then get distributed by three digits of code. And then get sorted by the last two digits of code down to the hubs. So San Jose might be a GMF. Scotts Valley, where we started Netflix, um, was was uh, the final stop for the five digits. 
But the post office was standard across the United States like this, so it was very consistent. You could predict and plan for it. That was was that was critical. Um, and when I walked in there into one of these GMFs, uh, I didn't find a lot of people in there. This was the late '90s, and they had spent hundreds of millions of dollars replacing a lot of their manual processes with um, huge, huge machine processing. The envelope, you know, we're talking truckloads of envelopes, like letters, envelopes, flat mail, boxes, everything would come in on semi-trucks to the back of the dock and dump right in this one conveyor belt. And that conveyor belt was designed to then sort the mail. It's a mail sorting facility. And the, the post office sorts by size. And so if it was, they had like levers and like ticklers and they, you know, it would sort the bigger boxes on one line and the smaller boxes on another line, the flat mail on another line. And if it was a certain size, size of an envelope, it would go on the envelope line. Um, because the envelope line had a, and I, might, I may be getting too detailed, but it is really interesting. The envelope line had 40, had a 40,000 um, letter per minute drum roller really tight drums that were going around almost like a car, and like major, major RPMs. And this whole design was to make sure that the envelopes did not stick together. Imagine your envelope to your grandma, others all together, right? They stick. Like, this thing was designed to separate envelopes at 40,000 letters per minute. Well, imagine if your disc and these huge metal rollers got into that machine. <laughs> and they did. The early experiment, they did. And... We lost 100% of the discs that went in that run. 100%? Wow. Well, yeah, it was just crushed. <laughs> now, it was only five I put in there because we weren't actually shipping yet. This was before we actually started shipping. But it was like, I came back from that one day, and I thought, I only had eight, my first eight hours, one of my first days, um, and I, I was in there every day for three months. And I came back to the team, and I said, I think we're in trouble. Because <laughs> I didn't know about the other machines yet. Um, so that's just an example. And then I went back the next day and learned, well, how do I, I ask the question, how do I make sure my envelope does not get into that machine? Is there any way possible? Oh yeah, you just got to sign your envelope bigger. What? Yeah. Okay. So we designed the envelope a little bit bigger. Sure enough, it doesn't go in that machine. The machines in front of that route it to the flat mail sorter. Ah, good. We're back in business. So it's just this, you know, iteration of designing the envelope bigger. We went through 150 different versions of envelopes in probably the first two or three years. I lost track in which we load the disc backwards, upside down. Um, we designed the envelope so it would go in this, the left-hand side of the envelope versus the right-hand side of the envelope because the leading edge of the envelope was the critical thing in some of these processes that sometimes it would get cracked from the leading edge, and if the disc was against that leading edge, we'd put pockets in the envelopes. We did all sorts of things to make sure our disc wouldn't break, right? It wouldn't get crushed. Now, one of the things I didn't ask you is, how did you get into the GMF in the, same, in the first place? So, uh, I knocked on the door. I literally just knocked on the door. They, they didn't know us from Adam. So there was a business center, and I called them up, and they said, sure, come on down, we'll talk to you. And I literally knocked on the door of the San Jose, it's in Meridian Avenue, where it was, um, right in San Jose, and introduced myself, and I said, this is what we're trying to do. Do you guys have any advice? And they're like, sure, come on in. And they take me to a back room, and after a period of about a week, I find out, I come to find out that what I thought about the post office was completely backwards to what the post office actually was. The post office in 1997 was probably operating at its best, um, at its highest efficiency ever in the history of the post office. I looked up on these gigantic warehouse. This, this warehouse, we're talking a GMF, we're talking a 200,000 square foot warehouse. This is a huge warehouse. There's banners on all walls doing metrics of employee satisfaction wow. at the time, doing metrics of customer satisfaction, doing metrics of... Um, three days or less for first class, that if, like, and there was a percentage on the board, and I asked it, what is all this stuff? And they said, yeah, well, we all get bonus at the post office if the uh, internal auditor pulls random mail and it all, it gets to and from any location to any location in three days or less. That's what we promised our customer at the post office, three days first class. If we achieve that mark 93% of the time, 
Everybody in the whole company gets a bonus. I'm thinking, this is a government? So it was really bizarre to me, right? And what I found, came to learn was uh, they have you know, Harvard MBAs, Stanford MBAs, like running, setting up all these processes. It was awesome, really awesome. Yeah, I think a lot of and people. So getting to know people, talking to people, they had experts for everything. Now, each of the experts, whether it's the transportation expert or the machine expert or the, um, you know, the, the, the one day shipping expert or the first class expert or the flat mail, they literally broke their, they all knew their stuff, right? But they had never seen anybody come in and try to wrap it all together and design a system around it. And so we became really good friends. And so I tried to pick the best of, like, When's the last time an envelope comes off the line? No one ever tried to ship a first-class piece of mail up until then in 24 hours. I was like, oh, it's going to be done in three days. Don't worry about it. Like, no, no, I need it there in one day. How do I do it? Like, well, we're not designed that way. I was like, well, I don't get that we could do the. <laughs> we can take your best of from your express skip shipping, your express shipping unit, and your best of your transportation unit, the best of your, you know, three-day unit. Can't we just mix them all together? So we did. We made sure that, you know, and then we backed those processes all the way up into our engineering. And this is the key part, right? So once you learn that the the plane for Boston from SFO leaves at 10 o'clock at night, which it did, because that plane lands eight hours later at 6 o'clock in the morning in Boston, and it only takes an hour to get to that GMF, and they start their run at 8 a.m. Once you start working backwards from your requirements, then you can work all the way backwards to when's the last time that we can print a label inside of our warehouse to get it into the disk, to get it on the truck that goes into the San Jose post office to make sure that it has enough processing time to get on the truck that goes to San Francisco airport. So we literally built all of our processes backwards like that. Wow. Um, because that was our goal, right? I don't think anybody, well, I don't know if people do that, but I would encourage people to start with kind of what is they want and completely work backwards step by step by step. And you'll learn a lot, and we learned a ton. And every one of those steps changed our engineering requirements. Every one of those steps changed the way we printed a label, for example. Some of those steps changed the way we actually processed internally, like actually picking the disc off the shelf. And we never would have done those steps unless we were actually trying to achieve an end result back here, like a very critical one-day process. It took us a couple of years to get there, for sure. I mean, this wasn't all done overnight uh, by any means. Yeah. It took us years to get to one-day shipping oh, and one-disc shipping, not three-disc shipping. It took uh -huh. us a couple of years. Um, and just sticking with it and knowing, you know, if you can be done once, which we did somewhat early on, then how do you do it 10,000 times consistently? How do you do it 100,000 times consistently? Doing something once is different than doing it 10,000 times consistently, right? And then you find the bugs and work out those bugs and find some more bugs. And, but it's all in service of, you know, faster to the customer, more convenient to the customer. You know, putting the disc back in after they had watched it was not something that was obvious in the early days, another experiment. Um, we actually had two envelopes going back and forth for the longest time. Um, and then we woke up one day, I literally woke up one day, and I saw an AOL mailer that was in the old days, AOL would accompany many of the doctors, may not even know anymore, um, would send their CDs out for free to get them to use the online service. And I noticed they had a trifold. And I noticed many of these CDs started having trifolds in my mailbox. I'm like, why don't we have a trifold? And if we had a trifold, why couldn't my packaging team just rip off the first fold and it would leave the return address on the other side? I'm simplifying many, many weeks and months of learning, but we eventually got there. and We're able to create an envelope that had an outgoing label that would then, for any of you who use the old Netflix envelope, there was an outgoing label that you would rip off because you don't need it anymore, and the return label was pre-printed with the local GMF you wanted it to go to. So now all the customer had to do is take the disc out of the DVD player, put it in the return mail, drop it in their mailbox or any other mailbox, and it was done. Instead of where did I put that other envelope? Right? It's those little things that make a huge difference um, as experiments. Yeah, that's wonderful. Um, so you earlier described uh, that first day in the warehouse uh, where, you know, your five uh, DVDs were, you know, damaged. Crushed. 
and crash it. You came back to this moment of uh, crisis, like, hey, I think we're in trouble. So I'm just curious, uh, were they, are there other stories like that where you oh, really yeah. ran into some very difficult challenges, and, you know, if you can share some of those? Well, uh, yeah, I mean, I think, I, honestly, I think there were challenges every single day. I mean, there wasn't a day that we actually declared success. Um, so it took us, we went from, we went from uh, assembling a team and four months later actually launching a website. Now at the time, going from team and a shell with empty space and empty whiteboards to launching um, in four months was, we were the fastest e-commerce launch ever. E-commerce is very complicated. Today it's done a little bit, fa a lot faster because of commodity items like AWS and just hooking up this to that and all the pieces were, were, are built for you today. Back then you had to, you had to design your own checkout. Back then you had to design all of your web pages and anyway, it was a huge monumental effort and um, boy, I remember when we launched on day one, um, we just did not anticipate the demand. And, you know, it sounds trivial, but we had 500 orders in the first day, thinking, um, you know, we thought we would get 100 orders in the first day. We didn't, we didn't market it to anybody. We didn't tell anybody. All we did was turn on the website, thinking no one's going to find us. Certainly no one's going to order. Um, how, did, how did they find you? Well, we were out there actually chatting with Usenet groups. Uh, Usenet is another yeah. chat forum way back when. Um, but it's, it's a, it's a, today it's a forum for all you people out there. An internet forum, and we would talk to people about this idea of shipping DVDs to the mail. What do you want to see? So we had a lot of our talking to our avid customers that way. Well, it turns out, like we didn't anticipate, these 15,000 DVD, avid DVD, like collectors, buyers, they weren't even thinking of renting. We're talking about us for the longest time on this channel. So when it opened, someone just posted the fact that we were open. Oh, wow. <laughs> 500 orders in the first, like, three or four hours. And we realized the biggest problem was our laser printer. We were laser, laser printing. Printer. Yes, we were laser printing our labels, right? And we're like, we're in trouble. We don't have enough, A, we don't have enough printers. B, we didn't design our engineering to ship to more than one printer. And C, even if we did, our printers aren't going to be fast enough. Uh-oh, we better scramble fast. So that's just another example of you can't anticipate everything. Yeah. Um, but that's How did you solve the printer problem? We went out and talked to a bunch of vendors, and like, there's got to be a way to print faster. We, that we didn't even think about that, right? We just thought about, like, okay, yes, of course there are. You see them every day, right? We stumbled on the printer manufacturer's Zebra and, like, got the faster printers. But of course, it has to fit our paper and our envelope, and so that was different, right? All that stuff, so labels and sticky labels. Like those printers don't like sticky labels. How do you make labels that you can peel off? And, yeah. So you know, it's all that stuff. Wow. And um, you know, earlier I asked you about. Uh, so I have uh, one more for you. Can I do one more? Great. Yes, please. Do. <laughs> so, <laughs> the other thing we learned. So there was a there was a movie in in 1997 that came out. Um, and many of you know this movie, I know, called Titanic. So the Titanic was the number one grossing movie still of all time. And, of course, it was one of the first movies to ship on DVD. I think it was actually 1998, um, because we didn't watch until 98, but I think it was 98. Um, and the Titanic, uh, what, we, what we learned the hard way, though we have known this in theory, we just didn't know it in practice, is that there's this thing called the decay curve in the video industry, which means that 25%, and this is just general terms, 25% of your population, whether you're a mom and pop video store, a blockbuster, or even a small little thing called Netflix, 25% um, of your customers are going to want the blockbuster hit on day one, it's released. This is why blockbuster was blockbuster. And it's, it's also why they had a huge problem. Because the, the problem is, in order to satisfy those customers, customer satisfaction, you better have that disc when they want it. Well, if you've got 100,000 people, which we did after a couple of years, you're going to need 25,000 discs of the Titanic. Maybe it was 1999. So I'm, I'm missing my dates, but it, let's just say there's 100,000 people in your membership. If what they want is to be satisfied, then they, you're going to need 25,000 Titanic discs on day one. 
times $20 a disc. You're talking $500,000 in a startup just to satisfy one title out of 3,000. Guess what? The next week, so different. 20, you know, <laughs> only 12,500 of your customers want that disc. So within a week, you only need 12,500 discs to satisfy those customers. The next week, it decays in half again. Until six weeks out, you only need about 1,000 of those titles. So in a period of six weeks, the cash flow issue between 25,000 discs and 1,000 discs that you need to satisfy your customers is a huge problem. And it was probably the biggest problem of Netflix that, was, that people don't know about for, for several years. We were profitable on a order-by-order, order, subscription-by-subscription basis, and we were massively... Um, uh, mass, mass, we, we had a massive cash problem, working capital problem, in order to fulfill buying the inventory for our discs. All of our fundraising, all of it was going toward filling the inventory and convincing our investors, don't worry about it. We're not burning as much cash as it seems. It's all going into the inventory. When we can get these turns right and be at scale, it'll all come out as profits, but you're just not seeing it yet. You keep seeing us asking you for more money. <laughs> the model's good, but the cash to operate the model was bad. Well, what happens to all those discs that uh, no longer needed? Well, you had to quickly figure out a way how to, you, you know when you go into the old days of Hollywood video and, and you see the discs for $9, you know, the discs for a dollar? There's a huge industry in and of itself of used discs. And we were a small part of that. Blockbuster was a huge part of that. Imagine Blockbuster with their 1,500 square foot physical locations, 6,000 locations, and they can only put 100 titles on the wall. Right? Their backlist wasn't very good, and it, all their customers wanted, like, and when you went in and saw the Titanic and Blockbuster, there'd be like 100 Blockbuster or Titanics on the wall. This is why they, like, had an issue, right? Because... You know, they just never actually solved it. So what Netflix did, we started actually, this is what started creating the algorithm of if you like this, then you'll like that, which we were in the first algorithms to create this. And the reason we did is we realized very quickly that we had to market the backlist, that the backlist is where all the profits were, that if we stayed with trying to satisfy our customers with the, with the Blockbuster, we were going to be out of business just like Blockbuster was out of business three times over the period of those 10, 15 years. Eventually, they're now completely out of business. But um, this is why these, these video rental stores were having a really hard time being profitable. So we actually started taking the hits off the front page when you came to our website. We started saying, hey, we've noticed you watched this before. Why don't you try one of these? So we were really marketing the backlist and helping out our cash needs from inventory. Huge, huge problem. Uh, yeah, that's interesting. And uh, again, uh, uh, people don't necessarily think of that as being a problem. Nope. Now, earlier you mentioned um, how uh, you know you had to, uh, in your experiments, uh, solve for what the customer wanted and also solve for making sure you had something that was scalable. Now, how rigorous was your data collection as you're running these experiments? Pretty rigorous, right? We tracked everything. Um, we tracked how long it took, the time it took. We tracked defective disk percentages, inventory turns. Um, we tracked, like I said, airplane schedules and where we placed the barcode. We tracked everything because we knew it had to lie, that our answer had to lie with one of these metrics. At the end of the day, you slip a disk into an envelope. It gets routed through the U.S. Post Office to whatever's on the outside of the disk and it gets routed back to you from whatever label you got on the inside of the disk. And the customer touches it in between. There aren't that many touch points. Mm -hmm. But you have to monitor every single touch point. And you have to understand what's happening at that touch point. What can I track at that touch point? So any entrepreneurs out there, I'd highly recommend you, you look at what we used to call it, um, Netflix still is in the industry, called time and motion. It's, it's, it's understanding the time and motion study of any activity. And what that means is, at every touch point, things slow down. If a human's touching it, things slow down. How can you keep a human from touching it? Speed it up faster. 
or how do you make it easier during that touch? If it has to be touched, how do you make that human touch it faster? Do you make them so? Example. Um, in the very very early days of our warehouse, our 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 people would go pick the DVDs off the shelf just like you would do at a blockbuster. It was our own shelf. It was great. Our own library stuff. And they'd walk back and they'd ship it and go over and put the label on it. I'm like that doesn't make any sense. Let's have the shipper sit in one spot and have runners go run. Time and motion. Eliminate time. Eliminate motion. Um, uh, when the DVDs came back, right, we had a similar process. Now, if you go into a net, like you can get on the videos, there's many videos done over the years, like starting in 2004 or 5, they're, they're actually still on YouTube somewhere, I'm sure, that actually show the inside of the Netflix operations, and it was pretty secretive for a long time, but actually show it, and if you actually don't listen to the talking head, um, sometimes it was Reed, sometimes it was others, like newscasters, and you actually look at what's going on behind them, like I encourage you to look what's going on, mm -hmm. you will see that there's a bunch of people seated, not seated, not moving. And, we, and I, I, we built barcode scanners in there so the basket would come to them of returns. They'd simply scan the return in like a grocery scan and scan it back out again. And nothing would move back in inventory. Scan each disk, open up the envelope, scan the disk back in with the barcode. Do all the scans in, time and motion, because that's the most efficient. Scan, 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 scan. Wait. The engineers would like do their magic in the side, press a button. And now the computer would tell the person sitting there, now produce labels for the, where these disks are going. Once the disks were here, you could understand where the disks, how many you had in inventory, and who they went to next. Predicting that was even faster with a subscription queue. So now they waited, and now they did the opposite. Print the label. Who is this going to? And it goes from right to left, left to right. Nobody's moving anywhere. Now you've got a scalable operation. Wow, and so the, the, the disc never goes back on the shelf? Never. Wow. So if you can reduce time and motion, you can make things faster, easier um, for everybody involved, right? And you can, like, think about how few, many more few people you have to hire. Like, the inefficiencies of doing it one way versus doing it another can be the world of difference between how many people you have to hire and literally how fast it takes to get to the disc of the next customer. It all works together like a nice orchestra. Yeah, it's phenomenal. So um, Scott Cook, who you know well, and to its founder, uh, he talks a lot about experimentation. But he says, you know, when we run experiments, we should savor the surprises. Oh, you bet. Uh, so I'm, I'm just curious, what are some of your first, biggest first surprises? Of all, first of all, big fan of Scott Cook, <laughs> big mentor. Um, boy, I just, you know, I can't thank him and that team enough for embedding this kind of DNA of customer first mentality. So Scott, if you're out there, thank you. Um, huge surprise for us, uh, for me in particular, um, was what I would call the rural opportunity, not the city opportunity. All the blockbusters, most of the blockbusters were located in big, big cities. Um, but when I started doing the first pin map, I got this United States map put it on the wall in the operations center, and I started tracking where who our best customers were and putting pins, you know, like the classic number of pins and bigger pins for 25 people and bigger pins for 100 people. You step back from that map after a while, a few months, and you say, wow, we've got statistically significant more people in rural locations than in city locations. And the reason for that, you got to pause and say, huh, I guess it still is easier for those city people to go to their Blockbuster store. But we're the only option for a rural. Let's market to those people differently, right? Those people ordered a lot more DVDs right. than the city people. In the wintertime, they ordered even more. They're snowed in, yeah. right? So it's like, oh, there's a lot of surprises you can get from that on just paying attention to your customer, where they are, what they're doing, what they're watching. Um, that was a huge surprise. And what's a diff, uh, an example of how you market differently to, in this case, this rural customer? Um, you know, do, do you want us to, you know, like, did you, reminding them there's a description queue. Not everybody was using the queue. It wasn't, it wasn't, it wasn't obvious. 
hey, we noticed that you ordered three discs last week. Did you know, you know, have you, have you seen our subscription queue? Would you like to tell us, like, the next ten discs? Well, of course they did. Yeah. Great. Once we had their list of what they wanted, then we could say, you know, well, if you like this, it really started helping all of us. It looks like they order this kind of genre. It looks like this customer or these set of customers will stay within the same genre. We can start predicting. So we started experimenting most with those people and then working it back into the city people. Yeah, I'll share an interesting story. Um, I worked with uh, one of my friends, Amy, who worked with, that, with her at Intuit. And Amy, I think for her, uh, the course of her adult life never has never owned a TV. <laughs> and, um, you know, she, she loves the outdoors, spends a lot of time camping. But uh, so, but because of that, um, and she didn't go to the movies a lot, so she was one of those people who was a lot of times left out of the conversation when people are talking about movies sure. and whatnot. But because of Netflix, uh, you know, she, so she became a big Netflix user, was on the queue, and then still, still didn't own a TV, but she could watch DVDs on her laptop. Oh, right. And often would uh, watch this laptop while camping in the middle of nowhere. Right. And so she very quickly uh, sort of caught up <laughs> and watched all the classic movies. So I always think of how Netflix literally changed her life. Awesome. Good story. Yeah. It, it kind of reminds me, like, one of the things that I, I wanted to talk about, or at least touch on today, was this arc of storytelling. So what you just did there, I believe, is a critical example of what all entrepreneurs need to design, actually try to design in their business. It's hard to design a story, but if you could think about what story do you, are you telling? We always think about what story are we telling our customers. But I don't think we think enough about what stories do we want our customers to tell their friends. How can we design our story so they can remember our story and tell our story, tell our story through their voices to their friends? That's great. And one of the things that, I, that stayed with me for years is I remember as we were going through the Intuit IPO and talking to Scott and and looking at all the documentation and how we talk to analysts, we just kept harping that um, that Quicken had 88% word of mouth. We didn't do any market, hardly any marketing added to it. We did a little bit, but not a lot. That all of our growth was word of mouth. And when I got to doing e-commerce, I realized at Netflix that 88% of our of our stuff was word of mouth. It was like between 80 and 90. So 88 kind of stuck with me in the a few of the numbers were 88. I was like, oh, like a huge percentage is word of mouth. And word of mouth is all rooted in storytelling. The exact story that you told. Yeah. Because like, it's really hard to tell somebody you really should rent the disc in the mail. What are you talking about? Are you going to be able to explain that as a company to a customer? And I'm sure many entrepreneurs have these very, very targeted products. And the more targeted it is, the more it's difficult. The more difficult it is to say what the benefits are. It's another thing to have a customer say, "No, no, don't worry about it. It's so easy around the dinner table. All you have to do is pop the disc in the machine, and they give you the return envelope. You just tear it off, pop back in. It's that easy." And I'm like, "No, it can't be that easy. No, really, it is that easy." And so all these customers, just like you were saying, you really got to try this. Right? And they were doing all our work for us. So design your product with storytelling in mind is, is a big, big, um, big, big piece of advice. Yeah, and, you know, the, the height of uh, Netflix, uh, um, you know, physical DVD business, uh, I, I know uh, this happened at Intuit, and I think happened at some other places where the, um, the, the shipping departments at companies basically said, No more! No more! <laughs> because that quickly became the bulk of uh, right. <laughs> the mail right. uh, inside companies. It was just people returning their... Uh, well, the same thing is happening today with the Amazon packages. So we were just early with Netflix. Uh -huh. But I don't know, um, uh, many, many companies out there, um, their employees are shipping their Amazon packages to their companies. <laughs> and the mail rooms are just full of these boxes. So the same thing happens, right? Yeah. It's like if I'm here, ship it to me here. Yeah. Well, it's a good it's a good problem to have. Well, you know, um, uh, one last question I have for you. So, and then you've touched on this a little bit, but given your successful experience in helping Netflix get off the ground, what are a few do's and uh, don'ts on experimentation you would share with our viewers? Um. Definitely do always be curious. Like, never think that you can declare victory. 
and never think that the thing that you stumbled upon is going to, is going to kill the company. There is a way out. Uh-huh. You just have to think smarter. So don't prejudge. Don't don't introduce your own biases. The solutions are often unique um, and require you to stay curious. I think and embrace crazy ideas. Uh-huh. Like I said, we were told we were crazy for several years. No venture capitalist would really want to give us any money except for Foundation Capital. Thank you, Foundation Capital um, and IDP um, in those early days. But there's others like Kleiner, Sequoia, all those that this is crazy. Like you, you need to go try something else. Um, you should be crazy ideas with better ones if you can get the customer experience right. Um, and like I said, iterative step-by-step approach and work with the back, with the end in mind, work backwards. If you can do those things, right, and be very much like the scientist of old, not knowing what the solution is going to be, but testing and iterating and testing again and using the scientific method, you're likely to be successful without giving up. You know, be like, be like Thomas Edison. Was it Edison? Yes. Ten thousand times for the light bulb. Yeah. Right. Be like that person. Alexander Graham Bell, how many times did he try a phone before it actually worked? Right? Just be passionate as hell. And and you'll eventually win. That's fantastic. Yeah, and so, you know, I said uh, people might be curious to hear about uh, your current role at Mozilla, and, you know, you've been here again uh, to see another uh, organization grow from a small to yeah. a large. So is there any... Somebody want to share. A lot of people don't know, you know, Mozilla. We're trying to, so we're trying to do it again. Everybody knows us for Firefox. So thank you. Keep downloading Firefox. Uh, do my little, uh, my little uh, pitch. Um, every time you search, right, we make some money. That's how we make money. We don't charge you. Um, but we're trying to do the same thing. So we've experimented with things like um, Firefox OS for mobile. Um, we've experimented with connected devices. We're now um, – leaning even further into the Internet of Things and trying to figure out where Mozilla and Firefox can be that user agent for how customers are consuming the Internet and the web. And we think about Firefox as the user agent for this thing called the Internet and the ARPANET that was around, thanks, thanks to uh, Mark Andreessen, who, um, you know, created the browser. You know, Firefox is the next iteration of a browser, that helps you find things on the internet in a UI environment that's actually a piece of software that's easy to use. We're the middle person between the search indexes or what's out there on the web that you don't know and how to collate it into a, something you can actually read. How are we going to do that at Mozilla for connected devices? If you're using all these devices inside your home, outside your home, what piece of software or middleware can we actually produce that makes you the user agent of all these devices? That's what we're excited about. That's what we're working on. Yeah, and I think many people uh, probably know this, but, you know, Mozilla is a organization, is a nonprofit. It is. And it stands for, I guess, uh, having an open internet. Keep the web open, and, um, you know, the internet belongs to you, right? The web belongs to you, right? Um, so there's a lot of things packed up in there, but, yeah, keep the web open and and, um, and data privacy and things like that. So we, we are the... We are the one of the few private companies that, that don't have... Uh, a bottom line that we're trying to sell you advertising against. Yeah, well, thank you. It's really good for the web. Thank you for Mozilla, because I think, you know, all of us are beneficiaries of having an open Internet uh, and one that, you know, respects people's uh, privacy and security. So Great. thanks for that good work. Thank you. And, of course, thank you, uh, Jim, for the time today. It's been uh, really awesome hearing your stories, and I think I'm hoping there are a bunch of entrepreneurs out there who are inspired and, as you mentioned, be passionate and be like Edison. There you go. Thank you. Thanks. Appreciate it. Thanks so much, Jim and Hugh. We hope everyone enjoyed our webcast. If your company is interested in learning more about bringing the entrepreneurial spirit to your large organization, visit us at leanstartup.co and click education or email education at leanstartup.co.